Welcome to part three of our lecture series on probability. And what we talked about in the past was a couple of different types of probability. Let's kind of go back here. We talked about um, theoretical probability, which is like our perfect world probability on a dice, one out of every six, on a coin, one out of every two. We talked about compound probability of several events. We talked about experimental probability when we actually run, you know, uh, a probability or a chance event and we see and we observe what happens. And now we can actually extrapolate that into many, many, many uh, of those uh, experiments to see what happens. So essentially we're gonna be running a simulation today, a computer software that mimics probability and how it behaves um, so that we don't have to sit here and flip a coin a hundred times. We don't have to roll a dice a thousand times. We can speed up that process and see what happens. Make a prediction to yourself. If you flip a coin a hundred times, how many times would you expect the coin to land on heads? Knowing what you know about heads and tails, you might be thinking, well, it's 50-50. It's gonna be about even, so I don't know, 50 times out of that 100. But do you think it would be exactly 50 every single time you flipped it a hundred times? Clearly there would be some discrepancy there, but how much of a discrepancy would we be able to expect? Do you think it would be very common for there to be 95 heads and five tails? You might be thinking to yourself, probably not. All right, so what does this look like over time as we run a simulation that has 100 um, flips of the coin, 200, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000 flips of the coin? What happens to the probability of landing on heads? Um, and we're just gonna see um, what happens. So let's just go there. Let's go to my screen on, um, let's see if I can find it right here. Okay, perfect. Here's a little simulation software where we can actually set the probability. If we wanted to make uh, heads more probability than 50-50, we could actually change that, but we're not going to do that. We're going to keep everything 50-50, probability of heads, and we're going to set the number of tosses to be, you know, 15. And what we see here is that, you know, it's keeping a count of the experimental probability over time. So after, you know, one flip, the experimental probability of flipping heads was zero, right? So there must've been a tails to start. And then after two flips, we can see, okay, it went 50-50. And we can see kind of how that probability changes over time. So it was a higher probability at the beginning of getting tails, or sorry, I should say, a higher experimental probability of tails at the beginning. But then we can see the probability of getting heads was much greater here uh, towards the end. So kind of started out more tails heavy and then kind of ended more heavy on the heads. So definitely more heads flipped than tails. And we're not gonna to try to figure out exactly how many, but we can see up here, 10 heads versus five tails. So the, prob the experimental probability, the observed probability is about 66% versus 33%. Now we can speed this up and we can go to, you know, um, let's say 50 more tosses. That'll get us up to 85 tosses. And what we should see is that even though we can still see what the probability was before or our outcomes before, it was very tails and it went up in the heads, we can see something happening to the shape of the graph. And what we wanna notice here is what is happening to the shape of the graph as we flip more and more coins. And of course that's just 80 flips Let's skip this to and do 200 more. It'll be a total of 280 flips. Now we can see some behavior happening with our probability. It was very wild at the beginning, very back and forth, either very low or very high. And we can see this kind of oscillating pattern where it's kind of jumping up and down based on how many heads and tails. And we can see that it's slowly getting towards 50-50. And then it actually crosses over because we must have had a bunch of tails in a row. And the experimental probability kind of crawls into um, a little bit low, lower than 50, 50%. But as we continue to run this experimental probability, what we should notice is that over time, our line kind of flattens out. Now, we don't have these big giant jumps back and forth because of the variability, and that our line is gonna be somewhat hovering around that 50, 50 mark. Okay, so what we wanna notice is basically the more times that we run the simulation or the more flips of this coin that we have, kind of like the much more likely it's going to be closer to 50, 50%. So as time progresses or as our flips get higher, our theoretical probability of 50, 50 
and our experimental probability should be about the same. And we can see here that our experimental probability after 1,080 flips is about 46% compared to that 53%. Is it a true 50-50? No, but that's pretty close, right? After 1,000 flips, that's pretty close to that 50-50 mark. So as we flip more and more and more, we're gonna see that number kind of slowly kind of approach or more than likely approach that 50% line. Now, there are some crazy circumstances out there where I could now flip five or I had 5,000 times in a row. That's, prob that's, that's possible, but definitely not probable. So in the software, we're probably not going to see it. So this is what a simulation looks like that kind of mimics us flipping a coin a thousand times so that we don't have to record that on our own. Um, let's go back to what we do with this simulation stuff, like how can we use it to um, check ourselves? Let's go back, let's see. Now, we actually had a quiz on this where you actually get to practice running some simulations with dice rolling, one die, two dice, make some predictions based on what you know about the probability and then compare. So that looks something like this. So, or something like this, we're gonna talk about a single dice being rolled, okay? And I didn't put that in here, but if you were to think about a single dice being rolled, What's the probability of rolling a six? Okay, of one single die. Well, let's think about this. How many sixes are on a die? Just one. Out of how many sides? Six. So we could say basically there's one six, one side out of, you know, six total possibilities, so six total outcomes, six sides. All right, that's our theoretical probability. If we want to figure out what we would expect over 500 rolls, think about this. What is one sixth of 500? Well, use your calculator and actually do one divided by six times 500. That's one sixth of 500. And that is about 83.3 repeating, okay, which is about 83 times. Because if I did 83 over 500, that is the same fraction as one six, more or less, right? Down to like a very, very small decimal. So one six of 500 is about 83 of 500. So we can use this theoretical probability and multiply it times the number of rules in order to get our prediction. And now what we can do is we can now go to that software, find that software and see if our prediction actually makes sense. So let's actually go and let's see if we roll a die uh, 500 times if we end up getting, um, see how many we get. Let me go find my dice rolling software. Let's cut this down to one die. And how many times did I say 500? And you can see that I've actually rolled this 500 times. How many times did it land on a six? 89 out of those 500 times. Oh, and all my work got disappeared, got erased. That's too bad we had 89 out of 500. That's actually what happened with our experimental or our observed outcome. Now, if I ran another simulation of 500, of course, I'm gonna get something besides 89, probably, right? I'm gonna get these different numbers, but what was our expected outcome again? It was 83, right? Because of that one six times 500. And what we see here is that we're probably going to be getting numbers that are fairly close to our expected or our predicted outcome. Okay, so our experimental, our observed outcome should mimic, you know, the more roles we have, some approximation. Okay, so how do those compare? We should see that they are fairly close, right? And this is kind of like our perfect world scenario, but we know that we don't live in a perfect world. So this is actually what happened, but it's pretty close. Okay. So that's kind of how we can use theoretical probability with multiplying to actually come up with a prediction. And then we can there compare to see, you know, what happened. If we had something that was very, very different, that's either a shocking anomaly or we did some wrong math. Okay, let's take a look at the next page. Now what we talked about in the past is something called compound probability, where we talked about two different things happening and we can you know, the words and and the words or and how we kind of use those with probability. Okay, I'm giving you the following event. We're going to come back to prob uh, compound probability, but this time we're talking about additive, additive prob probability, which I want to introduce some vocabulary words. Let's say you're playing, I don't know, 
cards, but you've got these funny cards. I don't know, something like Uno, let's say, where you've got shapes on these cards. And three of those cards have square or rectangle shapes. Three of those cards have circle shapes. Three of those cards have triangle shapes. And each one of those uh, shapes has a different color on it. So we have nine different cards. All right, let's say each one of those is its own card. And you have this card of nine, this deck of nine cards. You shuffle them up and you're going to pick one. Let's find the probability of picking each one of these. So first, the probability of picking a rectangle, well, there's only three of those. So we have a three-ninths chance. Why? Because there's three rectangles out of a total of nine cards. Not too bad. Okay. What's the probability of picking a red or a black? Well, let's see. We have three red, right? That's three-ninths chance. Or three black. That's a three-ninths chance. So if we add those together, that's six-ninths chance. Let me go back up there and check to see if we actually have Six of those, black, a red, a black, a red, a black, a red. And I can see that there are in fact six of those. So our probability would be six ninths, that is true. By the way, this would be 0.3 repeating or 33%. And this one would be 0.6 repeating or 66%. Remember to move the decimal over twice. Now here's where things get a little bit crazy. What's the probability of picking a circle or a red card. Now in something like this, let's come on up and you might say, okay, there's three circles, three nines add or red, there's three of those. So you might be thinking that's also a six ninths chance of picking a circle or a red card. Let's go up and check. Um, circle or red wins. So this one wins, circle wins, right? That's red, that's a circle, that's a circle. This is a circle and this is red. But if I look up here, there's only five of those. So we calculated six ninths, but there's actually only five different options that would be circle or red. So how is that possible, right? Well, now we are talking about this thing called something being non-mutually exclusive or mutual exclusivity, being things that are separate that cannot be combined together. And what that basically means is one of these was counted twice down here. This is the incorrect answer. Because if I think about it, think about we had three circles three reds, we counted this shape twice down here. We counted it as both a circle and a red, but it's its own independent event. We can't count that as both of those. So what we have to do is we can still do the same calculation, but we just have to subtract one that was what I would call double counted, all right? The one card that was both red and circle. Why we didn't have to do that up above is because it was impossible for something to be both red and black. Those are two distinctly different colors. It was impossible to have anything besides just a rectangle here. But down here, it was possible for something to be both a circle and red, right? And if that is the case, we can't count that twice. So we can still add those things together. We just have to subtract that double counted. So what might help here is a demonstration or a picture of kind of how that looks. We have these two different types of events, mutually exclusive and non-mutually exclusive. Mutually exclusive is talking about two completely separate things. This would be like all of the red cards that I just talked about and all of the black cards. There is no overlap. There was no card that was both red and black. Where the non-mutually exclusive was actually when I was talking about all of the red cards and all of the cards that had a circle. And there was one part in there that was both. Okay, this was the and, the circle and red. So there was this intersection of sets, this kind of coming together union of sets. So how we do that probability is we're still gonna add those two things, right? So we still had three nines over here. Right? We had three of those, we had three of those. And, and then we had you know one out of these that was both. So all we need to do is say, okay, our probability is three nines plus three nines. And then we're gonna subtract whatever is both of those things. And we would get that five nines, which we kind of counted up to in that last problem. So once again, you have to decide to yourself, okay, do I need to subtract or not? Well, you should ask yourself this, is it possible that there's something out there that is both of those things? Well, is it possible for something to be both red and black? No, so just add them together. Is it possible for something to be both red and a circle? Yes, so I'm going to subtract that thing that was both. Okay, however many there were, maybe there was two circles that were red, I would have to subtract both of those. 
All right, and this is the difference between mutual exclusive and non-mutually exclusive events. So still thinking of the word or as and, but now I have to think about mutual exclusivity and whether or not I need to subtract based on those criteria. Thanks. <laughs>